uh, up close with E structures, Todd Coleman. Uh, very pleased to be here in, in Calgary, hearing what's going on in Western Canada and the opportunities here. And we now have an investor from the U.S. who has been very active all throughout Canada uh, in the past few years. Uh, participated in our Montreal event, participated in the Toronto event, and is exploring opportunities in Calgary and Alberta, as uh, well as Vancouver. So eStructure is the company, Todd Coleman is the speaker, is the CEO and president, and we have uh, Barb Johnson from uh, JSA to conduct the interview. Please welcome Barb and Todd. Thanks everyone, thanks everyone for being here, and um, Welcome to this, the, uh, the Cafe Data Center Summit here in Calgary. Uh, I, I'm saying that out loud because uh, we're welcoming people here who are in the room, but also who are tuning in via uh, Facebook Live. Uh, so welcome to you, and thanks for tuning in, everyone that's there. My, my name is Barb Mitchell, and, and uh, like Brian said, I'm with JSA. I, I'm the uh, Vice President of Business Strategy and look after the Canadian business, the Canadian division uh, for JSA, which is the PR and telecom uh, company representing tech and telecom uh, across Canada and, and the U.S. So I'm very honored to be here today with you, Todd, and to introduce uh, Todd Coleman, who many of you probably know. He's uh, been around the IT data center and, and tech space for over 25 years. That sounds really long. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, and most recently was the COO and co-founder of CoLogix. Currently, he is the president and CEO of eStructure Data Centers. eStructure Data Centers is the provider of network and cloud-neutral data center solutions. With, as of today, um, we'll talk about that later, but as of today with locations and servicing customers across Canada. So again, we're honored and privileged to have you. Here. Thank you very much, happy to be here. So we thought we'd just kick off with, uh, get right into some conversation. Uh, it's nice to uh, have sort of a chance to talk one-on-one, -on -one, but uh, you have a long history. Your intro speaks for itself, but you have a long history both in Canada and in the US. So it'd be great if you could give us some of your insights into um, what trends you see coming sort of north of the border and, and into Western Canada out of the States. Yeah. Well, look, you know, one of the benefits of double mics. One of the benefits of uh, of working in Canada is we always have the, the ability to sort of look at the crystal ball of the U.S. and uh, just Europe's in a similar position. Typically, you're anywhere from 12 to 24 months behind in the trends, and we're certainly seeing that play out in Canada in a lot of respects, with a couple of exceptions. Uh, you know, certainly over one of the things that has always intrigued me about the Canadian market is in the last six or seven years, there's been pretty significant consolidation of the sort of what I would call traditional carrier neutral, privately held data center operators across Canada, largely driven by the carriers. And you know, Robert, who was up here from Shaw, is a, you know, they're a perfect example of that. And, and you can go on to, to Bell and, and others that have sort of played that role. And so there's not a significant platform play in Canada that's carrier neutral. Um, as you said, my former company, uh, CoLogix, would be an example of that. Certainly, that is what eStructure is about. So I look out at this and, and look at opportunities. Uh, if you look at the Canadian trends today, the large U.S. incumbents, the digitals, the Equinexes, don't really play in Canada. Yeah, they, you know, they play a little bit in, uh, in Toronto, um, but, but they're not really Canadian focused. I suspect that changes over the next three or four years. Um, as uh, Canada evolves and quite frankly, uh, as they sort of uh, capture more and more market share in Latin America and Asia pack. And so we'll start to see some of those trends come here. Certainly we're seeing M&A activity, uh, I hope so. Hopefully we're a prime example of, of that M&A activity. And so uh, I suspect that we're gonna see continued consolidation of the market. Uh, we're starting to see, you know, we start to see more and more large block traditional wholesale plays migrating into the Canadian market uh, with a slight difference. You know, typically in the U.S. market, wholesale means you're a pod and a meg, 
And it's, it's an equivalent of bring your own beer party. You've got to bring your own infrastructure, your own engineering, your own redundancy and expertise. We're not seeing that market currently evolve in Canada. Will it? Possibly. Um, but what we're really seeing is when we say wholesale Canada, we don't really mean a pod and a meg and you bring your own redundancy and your own engineering scheme. It's really what I would call is, is high volume co-location. Right? And so the pricing model tends to be somewhere more than traditional U.S. wholesale and less than traditional retail. That would be that phone taking the video. <laughs> Anyways, technology is a great thing. We can multitask. Um, it, it, and anyway, so, so we tend to see pricing that, that varies, but what's really fascinating about it is these are customers that would traditionally either build their own or take down wholesale uh, in a large volume, but they want all the accoutrements of traditional co-location. They want the security. They want someone else manning the 24 by 7 infrastructure. They want someone else doing remote hands. And, and while, uh, and, and we've seen that, and, and we're at the beginning stages that, that's largely been driven by the hi hyperscale cloud providers. But I suspect that that market continues to evolve. Uh, it's, it's happened in the East Coast, and that has a lot to do with, you know, the, uh, the environment of Canada, right? We like the cool weather, we like the cost of power, particularly in certain of the provinces. And so that's beginning to attract more and more. And as we talked about in the last panel, the edge has a lot to do with that. And, you know, a lot of these markets, you know, no disrespect to the Canadian markets, but we would, you know, from a global North or North American data center perspective, we would traditionally consider uh, Canadian markets, even Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, as tier two markets compared to the larger markets in the US. But we're seeing more and more migration of content, the intersection of content and eyeballs to the edge. Uh, that edge market doesn't have to be a rural community. It could be a community of 3 million people or 4 million people sitting in one of our major markets. So I think all of those things, those trends tend to, will, will overall evolve in Canada and we're already seeing that today. So do you see, so further you were talking about hyperscale developers potentially being interested in the Canadian market. Do you see them specifically being interested in Western Canada? Is there, you know, what's appealing about this market uh, to those? I, I, look, I do. Um, it, 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 fundamentally, it comes down to a couple things. First off, cost of power is critical. Okay, so we've attracted them to Eastern Canada into Quebec because we have some of the lowest costs of, of power in North America. However, that's still an East Coast play, and eyeballs and content need to be localized. We've seen that trend play out over and over over the years, uh, and so we're going to see those cloud providers want to move their content closer to their end users, which by necessity means that they're going to move to the West. Now, they're already in the West. They just happen to be in the Western US, not Western Canada. And the more that data sovereignty plays into their vernacular, the more that they're hosting data, and the more that it's critical to their end customers that their data be acknowledged and truly housed with an SLA in Canada, the more we're gonna see that develop over time. And it's only natural that it's gonna move west. Now, I think there's a couple of critical factors in that, and that is, you know, we'll see that migration get expedited to the extent that the, the, the power companies in the local, pro the other provinces in Western Canada <coughs> decide that they wanna keep up with the power trends of Eastern Canada. Um, you know, Ontario is a perfect example. You know, historically, you know, two or three years ago, uh, we'd have tire pickers come through Montreal, they would evaluate, but frankly, because there wasn't a significant amount of capacity, there probably wasn't a, a significantly mature operator, uh, and they were concerned about sort of some of the local uh, and cultural elements of, of being in Quebec, particularly around language, that they found their way to Ontario. But quickly evolving, you're, you're asking the question, why well, pay 11 cents a kilowatt hour when you can pay sub five and a half cents? And so to the extent that Alberta, BC, and others, which I believe they're currently evaluating and, and about to follow suit, to the extent that they want to compete with Hydro-Quebec, particularly for hyperscale deployments, then for sure we're going to see hyperscale club deployments in Western Canada. So you brought up a, a lot um, about, you know, energy costs and whatnot, how do you see the, you know, the energy pricing has been obviously fluctuating. Yeah, um, how do you see those trends? 
impact well, it's, uh, I mean, right now, it, it sort of depends. I mean, there's, there's, there's been some news in Alberta about price increases of power. That would be, uh, that would be difficult uh, for the data center industry. Because uh, right now, look, I, I look across uh, most of Canada and I see stable pricing. And frankly, I see power companies that want to go and target the data center development or data center segment. So while we may see some trends, particularly at the residential area on down to sort of smaller users, we may see some price volatility. I think we're going to see some price volatility in the large deployments, but presumably with pressure to go down. You know, sort of if you look at Hydro Quebec, for example, they've gone out of their way to target large data center and high density deployments into Quebec, right? And if you, you look at their US advertisements, they're advertising, you know, somewhere around three and a half US cents a kilowatt hour. Now, the fine print is. Uh, that's at 100, 100 megawatts and you got to build your own substation uh, at a significant cost. But if you look at, for example, we're building out a 30 megawatt uh, data center in the former Montreal Gazette printing building and our costs are right around 4.2 Canadian cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, you know, for most provinces and frankly for most of the United States that's unheard of. Uh, so to the extent that we can see that come down even a little bit, look, in data centers, every penny, every quarter of a penny counts a lot. So to the extent that we can see the average cost in particularly the Western provinces, which is probably somewhere between six and a half, seven and a half cents a kilowatt hour, to the extent that we can see the power companies bring a penny off of that, that would be goodness for uh, the supply and demand chain. Okay, so switching gears a little bit, because, because we're in Calgary, and I think that uh, goes without saying that the oil and gas, the energy in the sector is vital to the economy of Alberta. How do you feel that data centers, specifically in, in Calgary, are poised to support uh, this industry with as they start to adopt things such as um, industrial IoT and uh, next-gen tech technologies? Yeah, well look, IoT is hitting everyone. So I, I think that's an, that's an obvious area that's, that's ripe for growth. Um, you know, obviously, you know, fully transparent, I look at Alberta and I question when is oil and gas going to come back. And, you know, look, the Alberta market historically has been tied pretty, he pretty heavily to the oil and gas segment. And the oil and gas segment is tied pretty heavily to the strength of the Canadian dollar. Um, so to the, extent that it, to the extent that we see either one of those become buoyant, you know, look, the Canadian dollar, roughly 80% of its value is, is tied to the price of gas. And so to the extent that the Canadian dollar begins to strengthen, we've already seen cost of barrels of oil come up, then presumably the oil and gas uh, segment's gonna recover. I think the real question is one of a data center supply and demand. I believe that if oil and gas begins to recover and or we see the local power companies change the pricing model such that we begin to attract other industry segments into Alberta, then we're going to see a we're going to see a recovery in this market in a pretty significant way. I think the real question that we all you know the the sort of if you're a data center operator, the fifty million dollar question is where are you at in the trough and and the uptick? Because uh, as I look out across the the data center environment, I would say if we get back to norm, which was a few years back, there's probably an undersupply of carrier neutral operators in Alberta, uh, and so I see that as goodness. So. You know, IoT is one of many applications that's going to drive that. I actually think that there's there's big drivers uh, if we change the cost elements of doing business in Alberta that will that will actually drive other industry segments into Alberta and change the way that data centers operate. Cost elements such as cost of power being number one. I mean, look, uh, you know, probably not in a good way, but real estate's already, you know, feral, you know fairly inexpensive, certainly compared to our brethren over in BC. Uh, and so, you know, th there's, there's three fundamental costs to a data center. The two are the biggest. One is real estate. The other one's power, which is the, the major one. And it's certainly the one that tends to attract other customer segments, such as the hyperscale cloud providers. And then the third one is the, the cost of, uh, of people. And it's frankly, for us, it's less about a cost and it's more about a skill set. 
Uh, but I firmly believe that, you know, that having spoken with some of the universities here and, and other industries, that that skill set is available or certainly reskillable. So how do you see then the difference between the, the major markets in Canada specifically, just looking at Canada and the, you know, take the major cities, Calgary, compared to Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto? What are you seeing as some of the differences? Yeah, so uh, obviously, look, not telling anyone anything they don't know. Three primary markets in Canada Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, uh, and then, you know, four or five secondary markets, uh, but Calgary being sort of one of those largest secondary markets. They all sort of have their own unique attributes. And so, you know, when we look at it from a market perspective, uh, it's not about Canadian macroeconomics, it's about local market microeconomics. Uh, and so, you know, you look at Quebec, uh, you got to balance sort of, um, you know, increasing costs of real estate. They're not as high as BC yet, but they're on the uptick. Uh, you got to balance sort of, generally speaking, historically, lack of um, sort of network and critical infrastructure skill sets uh, against incredible cost of power. Uh, and then also balance that against the cost of doing business in a, uh, uh, a French-speaking province uh, and sort of the cultural issues that go along with that. And then you look at Toronto and you got the cost of real estate and frankly you got the most expensive cost of power in all of Canada. Uh, but yet it's balanced that with it still being the commercial hub of all of Canada. So by definition, Toronto still grows uh, no matter what happens. Uh, it'd just be nicer and better if they got the cost of power. Uh, in a line. And then you look at BC, and uh, from a data center perspective, it's extraordinarily disaggregated. Uh, cost of real estate is through the roof. Cost of power is not bad, and, and hopefully uh, we're, we're hearing rumblings that it, it could get better. Um, but I look at that market with you know, incredible excitement because there, it is very disaggregated. There is no significant player. There is no data center today that's uh, carrier neutral that is more than probably 12 or 15,000 square feet and most of it's uh, old or older infrastructure. So look at that very opportunistic. Calgary, you know, uh, and Edmonton and the like, you know, I look at those markets and say, I believe as, as the, uh, the province turns around and we see either oil and gas turn around or other industry segments come in, that there is an undersupply in Calgary. Uh, and then Edmonton would be uh, an extension of that. So this is probably a good segue into, to bring up, I mean, today is uh, actually it's quite timely because you just had news come out this morning that eStructure has expanded into Western Canada with the acquisition of the Backbone Data Vault. Um, what prompted that move for you and what's the impact of that that you expect? Well, we're, we're obviously pretty excited to go into Vancouver. Uh, it's not my first foray into the Vancouver market. Uh, but uh, Backbone is an incredible niche player. As I just got done saying, the market's very disaggregated. There's a number of smallish players, uh, but Backbone happens to be unique in that they have a two and a half megawatt data center sitting in the, the Mount Pleasant neighborhood, which is also known as Hollywood North or, or Mount Pixel. Uh, and it happens to fall in line with a key industry segment that we've targeted in Montreal, which is the uh, the VFX industry or the, or the film studios. So over the last sort of five or six years, we've seen numerous film studios move from Hollywood, California to Vancouver. Uh, and you know that's been largely driven by skill sets. It's been driven by getting some of the processing north of the border. It's been driven by where they can find people uh, with skills either coming out of university and places where they want to live. And now we're finding because they're doing uh, sort of multi-geographic processing around the world and around the clock that they're moving those studios further east to be closer to, to Europe as well. And so we've seen uh, uh, you know, a significant number of film studios move to Montreal in the last sort of two or three years. We at eStructure happen to have uh, probably the largest, uh, you know, dare I say, I don't know this with certainty, but I have a pretty good sense that we probably have the largest ecosystem of VFX studios in our Montreal data center. Uh, we have, uh, a, you know, a number of studios that have moved in, uh, Double Negative, for example, uh, moved 600 jobs to Montreal, moved into our downtown data center, uh, and a number of other key players. 
so Vancouver was a natural extension, both because I like that market, it gives us a West Coast presence, it's disaggregated from a competitive perspective, but then it became the challenge of go find a player that fits our model. And we happen to find one that fit our model extraordinarily well, uh, in that it plays to our strengths from an industry market segment of, of continuing to penetrate the VFX segment. It plays to our strengths because uh, we are targeting high power density. You know, we, we sort of joke inside a structure. We used to walk around in, in a prior life and, you know, we'd say, you know, think 5kW to 8kW, that was high density. Now we walk around and someone walks in and they have a 10 kilowatt of cabinet opportunity and we laugh, we're like, that's not even high density. Because uh, most of our deployments, we got significant deployments, not two or three cabinets, but 25 to 50 cabinets of 25 to 30 kilowatts each. And the thing when you get to that level of scale, you bring in sophisticated customers. It's no longer the retail power game where you, where you sell them a fixed circuit and you believe that they're only going to use 40% and the rest is margin. These are customers that manage all the way up to their 80% threshold. Uh, and so that is part of our value proposition. And so this acquisition uh, played into that, that strength of ours. And then, you know, obviously, as I said, it's a, it's a niche play. Uh, we have a significant amount of capital behind us, uh, dry powder as I like to call it, and we plan to deploy that in, in Vancouver as well. So you should expect to see further expansion news coming from us. I was just gonna ask, and what about, um, and so that's Vancouver, do you have plans to expand into Alberta at all, into Calgary? Or? You know, we're, we're actively looking at it. Um, never say never, it's certainly, look, I, uh, I walk around with a uh, market expansion and acquisition list like most people walk around with a sales funnel, so um, you should assume that it's on my list. And obviously a benefit uh, to you to have locations on you know, both sides of the country, I, I'm sure that... Look, we, we set out when we went live with the eStructure brand in fe February of last year, we were very clear, we are going to be a pan-Canadian provider. Um, and so in order to be a pan-Canadian provider, it certainly means you need to be in more than one uh, Canadian city, uh, but we're not done. And, and look, we see the benefits of that, of building a platform, the cross-sales opportunity to our customers, of being in multiple locations, but having a single source to deal with, to know how we operate. You know, at the end of the day, no two data centers, particularly if you purchase existing data centers, are built the same. Uh, the look and feel is different. Uh, the operations may, uh, or the engineering may be slightly different, the level of redundancies, the type of equipment, the manufacturers, all those things can be different. But the way that you operate it and the processes and procedures, whether it's your go-to-market strategy or your operational and customer support strategy, that's the benefit of dealing with platform and that's what we, uh, we aim to build. So what's the, what's, uh, what do you see down the road then? You know, not just for each structure, but for the data center space uh, overall, sort of a longer range view, sort of the next two to three years. Yeah, so um, the data center market evolves, and I think, you know, picking up on a little bit of what the last panel talked about, I'm not sure I fully agree with everything, but we're going to see more and more new applications, and blockchain is one of those, right? So we've gotten hit with what I call cryptomania in, in Montreal in the last six months and certainly uh, in December and January it was it was manic to say the least. Uh, I think I, uh, I think I was probably receiving the equivalent of about 10 megawatts of demand every single week, new demand. So it was almost borderline stupid. Um, but that said, you know, we're going to see those types of new style applications and customers, the more that, you know, as the last and that doesn't mean that two or three data centers go away, quite on the contrary, otherwise I've made uh, a foolish hundred plus million dollar bet on a data center in Montreal. I don't believe that. But I think that there's applications within that that requires different types of redundancy. And so to, in order to be a data center operator going into the next three, four, five years, you better have a flexible plan. And your engineering better be flexible and be able to scale. Now that also means certain size, that means certain density, that means you gotta be able to house those applications in their own unique sort of sub data center environments within a data center. Uh, but those are important. 
Um, you know, look, we're seeing different applications evolve, right? Um, Quebec's gotten hit with uh, the blockchain mania, but we've gotten hit with AI, and, and we're going to see AI play out in other areas. And I actually think we're going to see AI play out in Alberta, and I think we're going to see AI play out in BC. And so all those new style applications, and there will be 10 other applications that we don't know about. Now, some of those will come and go and evaporate as quickly as they were thought of, but others will be around. So, you know, for example, take cryptocurrency. Um, you know, I, I will tell you right now, this, this probably says it all. Uh, if I were doing a cryptocurrency deal, I would ask to be paid in, in dollars. Um, <laughs> But, do I think blockchain goes away? I don't think blockchain goes away. I think it's a fantastic application that we're only just understanding the full potential. And by the way, some of those servers that, that we're mining currencies with, they also play out in the AI environment. They're the same server. So these technologies, are gonna, we're gonna see blurred lines. And I think it's incumbent upon the data center operator to embrace it, to understand it, to truly understand it, not just at the infrastructure level, but at the server and application level, so that we can we can evolve our critical infrastructure to, to meet those needs. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. And you mentioned, uh, you know, when you bring up cur uh, cryptocurrencies, and, and actually earlier you mentioned, uh, you were talking about data sovereignty, which I think is, is very important, especially, you know, in Canada, and depending on, uh, you know, the enterprise or government body you're dealing with, but how do you, approach that with security in general? You, you mean like physical security or, or more virtual security? Yeah, virtual. Well, look, we're, we're, you know, we're really a critical infrastructure provider. We do offer managed services, and so to the extent we have customers that come to us and want an a la carte, uh, we're able to offer that. Uh, we have an incredibly strong balance sheet with incredible backers that are deep pocketed, and so we do have customers that come to us and uh, want to use our balance sheet to purchase uh, their own infrastructure, server infrastructure, and whatnot. So we, we pay very close attention to what's going on in the uh, the virtual world from a cybersecurity perspective, because whether it affects our securities, it may affect the customers in our data center. And when it affects our customers in our data center, it could have a knock-on effect. I'll give you an example. Very recently, there was a, uh, an IP exchange that got hit with an attack, right? And so it clogged a whole bunch of connections, okay? Had no impact on us as a data center operator, and you know, we do offer a blended bandwidth service, and so we had failover, but it clogged a fair amount of bandwidth connectivity within the market for six or seven hours. And so those are the types of trends that we see. Now, I actually think physical security is becoming more and more important. So despite sort of the, the thinking of the last panel, I see trends where the most sophisticated cryptocurrency providers actually want us to be in a tier three secure data center. Not because they want the UPS and the generator, but they want the security that comes along with it. You know, we're starting here ramblings. The more that the value of the cryptocurrency goes up, probably less of a current concern at $6,500 a coin, but more of a concern at $20,000 a coin, there's always going to be some maniac out there that thinks they can back the truck up, go into the building, raid the servers, and walk out with $10 million like they're robbing the bank. And that's, there have been scenarios of that. So I think that you know, in some of those instances, there are sophisticated providers that are willing to pay uh, not for tier three redundancy, but to be in a tier three bunkered facility, which is slightly different. I think I've asked you a lot of questions, and I want to make sure that we have time. Uh, there's a lot of people here that probably have some questions for you as well. So, if we could just take the the last the remaining uh, few minutes here and uh, throw it out to the room, if anyone has anything they'd like to ask, Todd. Yeah. In, in the back. Yeah. Uh, hi there, uh, my name is Sean, I'm from the University of Calgary. Uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, video games, because Canada is the third largest player in the global digital games industry, and uh, it's a, going to be a $100 billion global industry in a few years, um, and it's already firmly planted here. And uh, as this industry is evolving, it's becoming more and more reliant on servers on, on a bunch, for a bunch of different functions. Uh, do you see that? industry making a big impact on the data center industry? And if so, do you think that will spill over to Alberta in any way, or will it be uh, 
mainly constrains the bigger primary. I just, I just want to repeat it just for people that are online. So the question was, and I'm condensing it, I apologize, but the question was uh, the video game industry and uh, the impact that that may have on the data center space. Yeah. So, I mean, the short answer is yes and yes to both of those. Uh, so we're already seeing massive uh, multiplayer online gaming uh, have a have an effect on the data center and the demands of it. Um, so you know we've we've seen there have been pox, pockets of that uh, slightly in Ontario, uh, in Ottawa in particular, significant pockets in Montreal, and we we have some pockets of it certainly in in BC. And I think Al Alberta is right for it. I will tell you. I mean, it's no no secret. Uh, Quebec was out of that game for a long time, and then the government offered uh, tax rebates and other incentives, and voila, uh, they all showed up. So, you know, I have I have three kids. They range from uh, 12 to 19, and the only cool thing they think they they consider about dad's job because they just think I push paper is the fact that a whole bunch of online gaming companies that they know the names of actually sit in our data center, and I meet with them every once in a while. Uh, so there's no reason why that doesn't play out in Alberta, but I think it is, if you watch where those pockets go, they, they go where, you know, three fundamentals, inexpensive power, skill set, and significant uh, tax incentives to show up. Yep. I uh, question, uh, very interesting, you said you put like a tier three and put it in the bunker. I think I've been in those bunkers a couple times myself. Trying to sort out uh, the blinds and security. But isn't it not, can you need clarify for me if your thoughts and opinions about security on that, that player data? Is it not also an incentive to have Canadian servers so that uh, we uh, we don't have to comply for our data going south? There's no borders, by the way. But your dad goes south on your iPhone and so on, to that extent. And um, can you clarify that in your knowledge? Uh, is it not better place to have game servers that do this uh, server that are part of Calgary uh, because of that security? Because we're not exposed to the page yet. Yeah. So this, the question was um, just around uh, <coughs> the data security um, in the, I don't know, you can summarize that maybe. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the, the, the question is one around data sovereignty and the benefit given security and the concerns around being, having your data housed south of the border translation in the U.S. Uh, versus having those on Canadian servers and, and housed in Canada where things like the, the Patriot Act don't exist. And, and there was a, a comment about uh, bunkers, so I'll, I'll address that one first just as a point of clarification. So when I, mean, when I say bunker, I don't mean uh, underground facilities. Uh, those sometimes scare the hell out of me because uh, that means everything's underground and things can flood. Uh, but when I mean bunker, I mean quote unquote brick shit house. Uh, so um, that's what I mean by a bunker type facility and, and sort of the physical security around it. So the answer to your question is is yes. I mean that is what data sovereignty is about and you've hit on the crux of e structure strategy. And oh by the way, I have the other blue passport. So I am from south of the border and I choose to build a data center platform north of the border because I believe in data sovereignty and I believe in the, the reality or the perception of housing your data in the U.S. has significant concerns for global players that aren't otherwise domiciled in the U.S. If you are domiciled in the U.S. as a corporation, then the reach of the, the Patriot Act has no borders. But if you happen to be a Canadian entity or a European entity or from other parts of the world, then it for sure does have borders. Uh, and so I think those are those are important elements. So the answer to your question is it's it's part of the reason why we're seeing significant trends from the hyper, hyperscale cloud providers because as soon as they started deploying their servers north of the border and being able to provide, and this is the critical piece, a service level agreement that says we guarantee that your board, your data is north of the border and will stay north of the border all of a sudden their demand curve in Canada shot through the roof. And we've talked to some of those hyperscale providers where they were deploying capacity of what they thought was their 10 year plan and they blew through it in two and a half years. So to your point, I think it's absolutely important and it makes total sense and we're seeing that trend play out today and it's, it's frankly uh, what we're betting on. So the second part of that, uh, I to, where do you see this trend going? So I can follow this. Where 
where, where good practice procedures are in place or equipment that's fine here today to see where this is happening in the future. What is the CEO's and the business and your planners doing to protect that? Or what can we all do to work together to, to make sure that uh, our, our space is exempt? You know, all these things are happening to be about the press, but they're true and high. Where, where do you see that going and what can, uh, what's your thoughts about the security group? So the question is just is just a, a build off of what uh, Todd was talking about in the and the previous question, which is where are the trends on that going? Well, look, it's uh, I mean your your guess is as good as mine, so I have no crystal ball. Um, I mean the the real answer is is you know one word is collaboration and and open communication. You know, in the past, uh, I think there's been a complete lack of transparency on data and security risks now. Uh, things, <clears throat> excuse me, like SOC compliance and other things, particularly driven out of the U.S., has driven a tremendous amount of visibility around data breaches. But those are largely with publicly held companies that have an obligation to their shareholders to disclose that as soon as it happens, and then it plays out in the front page of the Wall Street Journal. But I think the more and more that we all talk openly around our trials and tribulations and work together even if we're competitors. Because the, the, the real, you know, as most of you know in the room, if you've worked in the telecommunications industry for any period of time, it's a pretty incestuous environment. Your customers are your competitors and your competitors are your customers. And the more transparent we can be on what our issues are, particularly around security, but not limited to that, I think the more that we'll bring those things to the, the forefront. Um, certainly, when you're talking about uh, open architectures that cuts both ways. You know, I'm a big believer in, in seeing benefits to price performance curves. Uh, and a lot of times that, that argument means open architecture. But open architecture is also an invitation uh, for others to sort of know how you work those things. Uh, security is a perfect example, particularly on the physical side. You know, we're, we're certified in a number, we have a number of different physical security certifications. We're actually not allowed, pursuant to the, the requirements of the certification, to, to disclose many of those certifications for obvious reasons. Because if we do, we're telling everyone on the outside how we secure our, our first physical infrastructure, which obviously is an invitation for a breach. So there is a balance, but uh, you know, I don't have all the answers, and, and I'm not an expert in cybersecurity. But it, it definitely starts with open discussions. And, and sharing information collaboratively, even across the competitive set. Let me just say thank you again, Todd. It was uh, great to have you uh, speak to the room here today, and uh, always a privilege. Thank you. Thank you for having me.